All right. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, it's a real pleasure to talk uh, before uh, our uh, guest speaker talks. But, uh, you know, building uh, soil health and organic matter with cover crops is uh, uh, quite unique, and we found a good way to do that with the multiple species covers. Uh, but I think sometimes we have to think about how degraded our soils are and why did they get degraded was by the use of tillage and erosion, you know. Uh, when we started back uh, 200, 230, 250 years ago and we had uh, soils that were actually wood-based soils, organic matters of four to five to six, and today in Ohio most of them is one and a half to two or less, you know. So we have degraded these soils and caused uh, a lot of problems through erosion. Uh, you know, most of the good soil went to the bottom of the hill, as you can see, you know, and we also lose by wind erosion. I read an article yesterday from ARS of Iowa, and the article said for one pound of grain produced in, Ohio, in Iowa, they lose one pound of soil per year. You know, now, you know, if you're producing 200 bushel of corn and you got a 100 acre farm, that's 560 ton of soil a year the Iowa farms are losing. And I don't think we're much different in Ohio because our tea levels, you know, we're not maintaining soil loss to the tea. You know, we're above tea. I saw an article six months ago from Ohio NRCS. NRCS said that we were losing 5.2 ton of soil per year today with our conservation practices. How can we maintain organic matter if we're losing it off the surface, you know? So what I'm going to try to do is talk to you a little bit about diverse species, how important they are, how they can build the organic matter that we're trying to build. If we get 20,000 pounds of organic matter on the surface at planting time, we can change our organic readings by a 0.2 to 0.5 per year. We have never changed organic matters with tillage. Organic matters always go down with tillage, or we'd still be at five or six, you know. So as we look at these diverse covers, and we need to think of these diverse covers as with nitrogen fixing plants and grass fixing plants, you know. And it's hard to establish these in the corn bean rotation. I think we're going to see lots of new things coming in the next two or three years where we're looking at new rice, new oats, uh, new uh, clovers, new winter peas are coming on the market that's going to withstand a little cooler weather and do a lot more growth that we're seeing in the years to come, you know. So one good way to keep the organic mac there is to plant the covers and then roll them. You know, this is uh, our farm this spring. And there is 42,000 pounds of biomass that we're rolling down. You know, if you're doing the math, that's like 23 to 24 ton of hay, you know. Everybody gets excited. Can you plan into that? Well, it works pretty good, you know. Uh, and we can roll it and kill it. So what does that do for us? It keeps us from using one burn down or maybe one herbicide pass, you know. This field we had no herbicide on. This field had 330 pounds of nitrogen the day we was rolling that cover down. Did we need nitrogen for the corn? You know, we didn't. So guess what that means to my billfold? You know, I really like signing the back of the checks. It's a little tough for me to sign in front of the checks, you know. <laughs> so here we are planting into it, it's not a problem. You know, what we found, some benefits that we found we didn't understand and didn't realize, that we take this tractor and planter and go to conventional tillage, we go from seven gallon an hour consumption to 15, just pulling the same planter in conventional tillage. So guess what three or four gallon of fuel means in savings per acre or per hour? You know, a little plus to help pay for the cover crop. We've been fortunate over the years that NRCS and Extension thinks it's important to have cover, and we've had cost share programs to do that. 
I'm trying to show you how we can do it without these programs in case that golden fleece leaves us and we don't have that opportunity anymore. So let's figure out how to do this so we can do it and pay for the cover. On Dave Brand's farm, the cover crops either got to increase the yield or lower my expenses so I can use covers. You know, we've never been fortunate enough to have cost share. They told us we were innovators. I always thought I was behind the time, you know. But we can get along. Look what happens when you plan into that. That disc blade or flute decoder, whichever one you're using, or maybe both, will slice that residue. That residue is three and a half inches thick. And here comes the corn. Look at the picture of the corn. Look how dark green it is. We're going to have to change your management strategy, though. We may think about different varieties that will come through this residue. We may have to think about changing our planting date. Maybe moving it back one, two, three, four weeks. What matters? As long as that corn comes up, it stays green, and keeps growing. Guess what happens when a raindrop hits that residue? It soaks down through the residue, and we don't have soil erosion. We have less than 100 pounds of soil loss per year off our farm. And our neighbors are averaging five ton. Just imagine how much nutrients we're saving by not losing that five ton of soil. You know, as we go on, whoops. As we go on through the year, what do we see? We see that cover crop staying there. We see the soil temperature 15 to 20 degrees cooler. So what does that mean in August and September when we're not getting rainfall events? We're not, we still have moisture in the soil. Our plants are not curling up. They keep growing, you know. And we also think, and I think this is from just my observation on our farm, I think as we have this amount of residue on the surface and we get a rainfall event and that rain is soaking through that residue very slowly, that we are having some nutrients flush off of this cover crop and we make what we call a compost tea which is high in nutrients it goes down and makes the plants more nutrient available you know look at the color of that corn with no nitrogen and no starter fertilizer and no herbicide in the field you know we're saving money at three dollar corn we've got to figure out how to do this we may be looking at 250 corn, who knows? When I was in South Dakota three weeks ago, I saw 57 piles of corn in 900 miles that had over 500,000 bushel in every pile. I, when I come home, I figured Ohio didn't have to grow any corn next year. You know? Something's gotta be done. You know, but look at the results. You know, there it is. This is what we can expect, a good crop of corn. Very little weed pressure underneath there. There's a few little broadleaf weeds under there, but not enough to hurt the harvest, you know. How can we get it done? There's all kinds of methods of getting cover crop seeded. We can use a high boy seeder, but we've got to learn how to adjust our herbicide programs. We do not want a long residual herbicide if you're trying to grow cover crop because it'll hurt it. We won't get all the species to grow if you're planting a 10 or 11 way species out there and you put broad leaves with it and you've got a long residual herbicide, it's going to take the broad leaves out. And maybe it just leaves the grass part, you know. How else? There's what it looks like. You know, we can get pretty good stands. We got the soil covered. Once we harvest, we got green growing residue. We're building the microbial herd underneath the soil. Our farm has five beef cows and five calves. My neighbor's farm has one 300 pound starving calf as far as the biological things in the soil. You know? What would you rather be? Fat and happy like me or starving to death? You know? <laughs> But just look at what we, well, what did I do? Oh, there it is. But there it is, whoops, come on guys. There it is a month later. This is December. This is what we're looking for. Guess what we can do? 
we no longer have an erosion. The soil is warmer. Last week, our neighbor's field that was conventional tilled after he sprayed and killed all the weeds on it. It's brown. It was frosty. Our field was green and growing. We got cover crops six, seven inches tall now, growing right along, doing really well. Guess what happens when you plant soybeans in there? All of a sudden, we no longer see white mold. We no longer see sudden death. We no longer see the combine taking 16 gallon of diesel fuel to harvest the soybeans. It goes to 13 or 12. We increase the bean yield by five bushel to acre just to have the rye there. Why wouldn't you try this and why wouldn't you do it? You know? Think outside the norm. We do not have to have these fields brown like I saw driving up here yesterday. You know? So we started. This is how we do it. As far as I'm concerned, the bigger the rye is, the better. You know, we get phone calls. What are we going to do with five foot rye? Plant it. You know? Plant it. If you get done and you don't know you're done, just crawl out there, just crawl on top of the cab, look around. If all the rye's leaning over, you've done a good job. <laughs> if it's not all leaning over, go find out where it's still standing and plant some more. I mean, it's no big deal. Make it fun, guys and gals. You know? If you'll notice there's a little bit of mud on the cleat of that tractor, three and a half hours before this, we had a three quarter inch rainfall event. You know, I dried, dried that soil out enough that I could keep right on planting. A lot of benefits to it. A lot of management's got to be done. If you're not going to do plowing and tillage and, and spraying, you spend that time with the field and the shovel, looking at what's going on. You learn how to roll the crop. Maybe you roll it the day you plant it. Maybe you roll it a week before you plant it. Depends on the weather. Maybe you roll it three weeks after you plant it, depending on the weather. If you're out there in the field and you find slugs where you're planting soybeans, leave the rye grow. Why? Slugs do not like soybeans. You know, it's just like we're talking about other things. It's, it's like the critters in the soil. You know, if you got that rye brown and the soybean comes up and that rye's hungry, he's going to eat the soybean. You know, he's hard starving. He's not like me. If he's fat and happy eating rye grass, he's not going to eat the soybean. He's going to leave it alone. But there's the results. 74 bushel beans. No herbicides. No fertilizer. $12.50 worth of cover crop. Now I can sign the back of the check. You know. But we need to think about getting more diverse. A corn and bean rotation, you're not going to be able to hack it, guys. Think about what else you could do. If you're in the livestock business, maybe you could grow some barley or spelts to feed the livestock. You know? If you're a beer drinker and you can get on to learn how to grow barley, maybe you could grow it for some sprouting mills. Maybe a big market there in another year or two. Or maybe you just need to grow some rye, or wheat, or triticale for seed, like we're doing. You know, that's 106 bushel triticale. That stuff was six and a half foot tall, Bill. You can see how much residue is there. You can see how both that red combine and that silver cedar was both growling going through there, you know? But we got diversity. After you take this off, then you can go with a 10-way species, or a 12, or a 6, or an 8, and give those roots time to grow and get deep. Gives us another 30 days to 40-day window versus a 25 or 30-day window in a corn bean rotation. You know? Think about how we can do these things. Think about what can happen with keeping that residue there, improving the corn and bean yields the next two years because you stretched out the rotation, giving you a 10% increase in the yields by stretching the rotation. Whoops. Come on back up. There it is. Whoops. Uh, 
you can go with peas and radish, precisionally planted. If you don't want to spend a lot of money, you got a Kinsey or a John Deere or a White or whatever. Don't matter what color it is. The only reason we don't use John Deere, it's green. If you're planting into 10 foot tall cover, you go for lunch. When you come back, you can't find a damn planter. <laughs> That's why we use red, so we can find it. You know? But here's peas and radishes. Precisionally planted, just like you plant corn. Three quarters of a pound of winter pea or of radishes, 15 pounds of winter peas. $18 an acre cover crop cost. And you use the planter another day. Well, a guy says, What do you want to do that for? It wears out the colders. Well, I says, You know, if it's a $100,000 planter and you're using it 365 days a year, it don't cost you very much. If you want to use it four days a year, it costs you a whole lot of money. You know? So that's what we can do. We can build diversity. We build soil health. We build water infiltration. We have roots here 24 to 36 inches deep. You know, there's what they look like. Look at the amount of nodulation on that winter pea. Look how big that reddish taproot is. Guess what we found out? We put them both together. There's a symbiotic effect. What does that mean? That means it pulls the nitrogen away from the winter pea. So the winter pea thinks it's not building enough nitrogen, puts more and bigger nodules on. Guess what happens? The tube of the reddish gets bigger. Becomes bigger storage tanks. That's a 30 inch tuber, two and a half inches in diameter. If they're four inches apart in the field, just guess how much more water infiltration we'll have as that goes through decomposition. Just remember to call the fire department and tell you did it, because about this time of the year, it smells like a natural gas leak, and a damn fire department state patrol is waking you up at 3 o'clock in the morning wanting to know where the gas line is, <laughs> you know. Oops, come on. Talking about blends, this is 2012. We all remember 2012. That's when everybody around us had 40 bush of corn because we only had eight inches of rain during the growing season. This was planted on July the 23rd, this is September the 23rd, that's a 14-way mix. There was 42,000 pounds of biomass there, 394 pounds of nitrogen, 74 pounds of phosphorus, 400 pounds of potash, 300 pounds of calcium, 60 pounds of magnesium. And we see as we use cover crops and get deep roots, we bring up all the nutrients to the surface in a more uniform manner. We don't see things getting out of Keller. On our home farm, we have not put any lime on since 75 because our pH is still 5, 6 to 7, depending on which field you're in, because we're pulling up so much calcium, you know. Again, there's our covers, you know, a wonderful thing to plant into. Think about how many b beneficial critters we can bring as we have some of these covers blooming. We increase it a lot, a lot. we decrease the insecticide and fungicide that we're using because we have beneficial insects. You can come to our farm and visit. We're only two hours south of here. If you come and jail. Through the summer months, I'll give you a sweep net, send you out to the field. You can make one sweep pass, and you'll find 3,000 beneficial insects in that net, and only 30 harmful ones. Guess what? Why do I need to use an insecticide? You know. What we want to look at is we don't like to see soils that looks like this. It's cloddy. It's hard to get the water infiltration into. Look how that's breaking up. That's not healthy soils. But as we look at healthy soils, look at this. Just imagine, in 1971, that was your Cardington, clay-based, yellow soils, clear to the top, with less than 0.2% organic matter. In 2017, 
when we dug this pit. We had 21 inches of dark soil. Had an organic reading of 8.3. What does that mean to David? With 8% organic matter, I have somewhere around 300 pounds of nitrogen available to my corn plant. I have availability of 8 to, to 7 inches of water a year just because of that organic matter. My goal in the next three years, you can see the yellow clay at the bottom, till we get to bedrock at five foot, I want that all black. And we're gonna do it with earthworms, and with roots, and with infiltration. You know, those are things we see. If you look at the very side of the picture there on the right, look how granular and cottage cheese that soil looks, you know. This is what we're looking for. We want good infiltration. We can't infiltrate a four inch rainfall vent in less than a minute and a half on our farm. Look at these soils. Look how granular it is. On our farm, if you take a shovel and dig down, you will have at least 25 to 30 earthworms per shovel full. We can actually turn our soils over in the top seven inches in five years just by earthworms. So why do we need to pull steel? You know, there's the soils. There's what they look like from the past to the present. Whoops, hit the wrong button every time. Last slide, <laughs> this is what I like to see. 24 inch tuber, inch and a half in diameter. Guess what nice that cover crop that's worth? That tuber to the Vietnamese population in Columbus that come down with a shovel because I don't dig. It's gotta have a motor on it. I'm gonna dig it. But they come down, each one of them's three bucks. And they usually go home with like 50 or 60 in their trunk. So do the math. Helps pay for the cover crop. You know, it don't have to be corn and bean, guys. But I can plant corn afterwards and make a little bit of money, too. I thank you for your interest. And, Alan? Yeah, we got, what we're going to do now is we've got to switch over to video based. We've got some time to take questions. Yes, go right ahead. Questions, guys, gals, while we're switching around? Yes, sir. The question was, what treatment, seed treatments do we use on our seeds? At present, we're using none. We've been far and good enough along. For the past two years, we've, we've had been able to find bean and corn producers that will sell us untreated grain. And we're seeing great responses. I don't think you can do that the first year or two into no-till and cover crops. But as you look down the road, four, five, six years, I think we can wean ourselves off of these because we're seeing so many beneficial insects, plus the micro herb underneath the soil is protecting that seed till it comes up, you know. And that, to me, that's a 22 to a $30 savings in the price of corn, you know. Next question. Yes, sir. Uh, we started in 1978 with single species. In 96, we went to two-year species. In 2000, we went to eight-way and ten-way species. And that's where we found all the species. Dale's not here at this time. Or two years ago, Jennifer wasn't here. Maybe you're going to out of bounds. Okay, you can go ahead, Dave. I got it. Turn it off. Yeah, you can go ahead. Anything else? We got a few minutes yet. Yes, sir. We just have a fluted colder in the front of the planter. We run about 220 pounds of down pressure on the seed unit. And we got rubber closing wheels. We got a lot of expensive stuff. You know. And we get along really well because I think what's happening as we roll that cover, I really don't care how the seed slot looks because we have residue over the slot. You know. And our soil's so mellow, it just falls in. 
the longer you know till the soil gets mellow, you can act, you know, I imagine some of you guys could even take off your closing wheels and just watch that soil fall back over the seat disc. You know, that's how mellow that ground gets. Page 15, which is the inside back cover of the program. Yes, sir. So many of you will be obviously happy to have a return. Don't mention the number of CCAs in Ohio. Yes. We typically have about 350 to 400. Well, if the beans are on the second leaf or smaller, we'll roll it. It won't hurt the bean, you know. That will be done. If you're if you're in Canada and the beans are in the second or third leaf, they use a the best way roller and smash them down flat. And they stress them and they add yield to it. You know, you can go in with chemicals if you're using GMO beans. You can use Roundup, take it out. You can use other grass control products if you're not using Roundup and, uh, or GMO beans. You're using non-GMO beans. I like to manage. If there's a problem, I'm going to manage for it. Thank you. You know. Over, over in the chapel. Does that answer the question? Yes. CLM, certified livestock manager. So on that same clipboard that you see going past here, those are blue sheets. Well, on our farm, uh, we've been using GMO corns till two years ago. Uh, we went with some of the most elite corns we could find. Two years ago, and then in our test plot, we put non GMO corn beside it. And the Monsanto and the Pioneers and the Cropland Elite corns with all the package was 85 bushel less than my non GMO corn. So the last two years has been non GMO corn with no seed treatment, and we're still shoving 150 to 160 bushel, 70 bushel corn in our area. I think there's something going on with the covers and these new lead varieties because it will not accept the mycorrhizae. Again, thank you.